say I don't have capacity building in my presentation. <laughs> I checked. <laughs> um, and I think what I'm going to say actually builds on, ties in quite well with, it, with, with what has already been said this morning. So Australia's strong track record for managing biosecurity risk affords our primary industries valuable competitive advantage into global markets. The flip side is that our primary industries are exposed to trade risks from a raft of exotic uh, and emerging pests and diseases. Our governments are also exposed. Um, about 10 years ago, I ran a hypothetical at Parliament House that had Abbott and Gillard on the panel to do with a flu pandemic. This was before we had the, um, the, the um, recent flu strains come out. And um, when it became apparent that at the time in Sydney, we could only di diagnose five um, cases of flu a day in the public health lab, that was the capacity of the public health lab. We're talking five, five detections in the face of a pandemic. At that point, Tony Abbott just put his head in the hands and realised that pandemics can and will bring down governments. And the next week he was in at the health department asking questions. So big consequences for industries, big consequences for governments too if we get it, if we get it wrong. Um, so what are we man doing to manage the risks of pests and diseases? Uh, how well are we steering the large complex ship that is biosecurity? It is complex, as, as Greg was saying. Is that ship well equipped for, for future demands? Um, actually, last night, the Secretary, Andrew Metcalf, mentioned that DAF has a, a workforce of 5,000 people. Um, I was trying to look for a, meta a metaphor for biosecurity, and I came up with an aircraft carrier, which also um, carries 5,000 people on one aircraft carrier. And uh, I, it, it actually could be a useful metaphor. And then I'm thinking, well, maybe we need a kind of a whole navy, not just one aircraft carrier. Um, so I'm going to talk about some trends for biosecurity in Australia. It won't be comprehensive because it's such a vast topic. It'll be a bit selective. Um, I also hope to be a little bit provocative because um, I think biosecurity is well served if we, we all continue to ask the challenging questions as, um, as Paul was raising in his talk. Okay, so I'm pleased to say I'm on the same page with Greg. Biosecurity at the moment is all about an ongoing reform agenda, that this is the big task at, at the moment for our industries, for our government agencies, for our communities. Um, I think take home messages from, from an industry point of view, and I can see there's a number of experts here that I'd be interested to get your feedback, but I think for industries, I think the way of the future is really about value chain integration. How do we integrate biosecurity with our um, quality assurance and, um, and embed that into the system. Um, I was speaking to Andrew Spencer from APL yesterday, Australian Pork Limited, and he was telling me about the good progress in terms of implementing their tracing systems for pig pass, for tracing animals, and also fizzy trace. Is that what it's called, fizzy trace? For, so when you go and buy your pork chop now, it, that pork chop can be traced back to a farm because of this chemical tracing technology. So there's some very exciting developments. And, um, and industries you know, are coming on board. I think it is a challenge though, when um, there can be a kind of a disconnect be between what the peak industries know needs to be done to protect their industry and what producers know and understand at the farm level. And producers often don't really get quality assurance. Um, they see it as bureaucratic. So that, that's, that's an ongoing challenge for industries. Um, there are demographic changes. Uh, for example, in the cattle industry, we're seeing you know, bigger corporate enterprises, fewer family-owned farms, more animals per producer that has implications for our emergency planning and preparedness. Um, okay, on the government side, I think um, there's a lot of reform happening in terms of um, regulation and compliance. There, um, from what I'm seeing, the governments are really uh, hearing the need to reduce red tape, to use that jargon. You're seeing it at the Commonwealth level. Greg provided some great examples of, of, of putting that into action, and it's happening at the state level as well. Um, I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. Um, I think um, the, the thing that has to be said is that we're, we're seeing declining resources for biosecurity. Um, both in the government and uh, potentially in the industry sectors as well, with um, you know declining um, terms of trade. This this is kind of a major challenge, and also an opportunity to um, work smarter. But it, it also poses some significant risks, I think, at the moment with what's been happening. 
um, structural and governance reform. I think this is I think this is going to be a big thing over the next ten years, and um, I don't know anything about it directly. But from what I see on the internet, and I was speaking to Ria from New South Wales yesterday about what's happening in New South Wales, whereby um, 27 catchment management areas and what are they called livestock health services livestock health and pest authorities there's 27 of them they're being reduced in the next 12 months down to I think it was 12 or 13 local land services um, which will deliver government funded agriculture and natural resource management services advice and information and there'll be one central local land services board of chairs that will be made up of representatives from the regions. I mean, this is a pretty big reform and um, pretty exciting as well. And um, in speaking to Ria, she, she audits catchment management authorities and she's got a, going to a meeting of, with biosecurity people next week to learn you know, about biosecurity. And so I asked her, you know, well, who's going to be auditing these, um, these new services? Because I, th I think the biosecurity people get a bit twitchy if it's catchment management authority, NRM people um, <coughs> auditing their services. So it's going to require lots of dialogue and conversation between the NRM people and the biosecurity people to come into the one church and deliver more integrated services for, the, for their communities. And I, I personally think this is a, is a fabulous um, direction to go in. It's the direction we need to move in. Uh, it's going to take a lot of um, a lot of conversations and dialogue and working through at the at the at the community level. Um, I just wanted to give a plug to some work being done by Biosecurity Victoria. Not knowing that um, Hugh Miller, who kind of heads up BV, happened to be here today, but um, I think from what I've seen, Biosecurity Victoria is doing great work in trying to think about ways to better communicate the concept of biosecurity um, both within the organisation, um, with um, professionals outside the organisation, and I think potentially with communities as well. And this invasion curve concept, I won't go into the detail now, I probably haven't got enough time, but I think it's a really good story um, and, and very effective in understanding, well, for example, why governments need to push their investment to the left-hand side of this curve. So with the biosecurity continuum, continuum we've got prevention, eradication, containment, and asset-based protection. And there's good arguments in terms of return on government investment as to why governments need to focus on prevention and eradication. And we need to, um, and communities and industries really need to take responsibility for asset-based protection of what's happening in their communities. Um, so, I understand that, that um, Hugh and his team are developing this as a communication tool, and I think it's got great potential not only in Victoria but nationally. So if I was in the other jurisdictions, I'd be chatting to Hugh about um, what they're up to. Are the trends for biosecurity surveillance? I think the main trend is really about doing it smarter and how can we use um, technologies. Uh, we'll be, over the next 10, 20 years, we'll be developing pen side tests, bedside tests, sit the role of citizen science, how do, how do people, uh, real time, capacity for real time surveillance, um, or the developments in terms of um, mobile phone technologies. This has been around for a while now, but I'm not sure, I mean, there's still great potential to um, adapt those technologies for surveillance in Australia. Um, emergency preparedness, response and recovery, that's, it is about maintaining the aircraft carrier. Um, we've really got to make sure that it, people are trained, um, the systems are in place. I think the, my understanding of the most significant trend is really about how to integrate um, emergency preparedness and response for biosecurity in the broader emergency and security agenda at, a, at state government national levels. How do we integrate our capability um, because of course, in an emergency situation, there's just a d demand for huge surge capacity. How do, how do we achieve that? How do we do it better um, also between jurisdictions? Climate change. Um, this is something that we need to pay attention to. I just um, wanted to give an example here. Um, you know, to what extent are our industries prepared for the emergence and potential southern movement of um, arboviruses. These are arthropod-borne diseases associated with climate change. So examples are blue tongue virus in terms of sheep and cattle, um, bovine ephemeral fever and tick fever. It's 
we, we need to be um, looking at that. And, that, and of course, um, ongoing research is very important in these areas as well. I just wanted to make 10. Oh, I think I'm going OK. Transition to management. I just wanted to mention this because it's um, a topic that I think I'm allowed to say, Andrew, the chair of the National Biosecurity Advisory Council is here in the room. And I'm not speaking on behalf of the council at all. I'm speaking on behalf of Lisa Adams and Associates. But it is a topic that the council is looking at. And I know um, the National Biosecurity Committee is looking at. And at the moment, um, we've, there's transition to management arrangements in place for um, branch broom rate, myrtle rust, and Asian honeybee. And these are kind of case studies to see how we can improve um, transition to management systems. And by that I mean what happens when we get an incursion and for whatever reason, because it's not feasible or it's not cost effective, we can't eradicate it. What do we do then? Do we just kind of drop the ball and say, oh, you know, we're living with it? Or is there an opportunity for national cost shared arrangements to transition from that, the arrival of the new pest or disease and learning to live with it? And um, so there could be scope. We've already got uh, in place kind of world leading um, emergency response needs for how we respond to emergencies in the plant, animal and environment sector. Is there a way of building on that to extend those relationships uh, to managing out of an emergency response into living with a pest or disease if it can't be eradicated? I think that's something that's going to be on the books for the next few years. I um, wanted to just mention, there's this new term I didn't know exists called social license issues. <laughs> I just thought it was just what communities think. And, and of course, this is highly relevant, as, as Paul has spoken about. Um, just to some examples, animal welfare issues, you know, no longer is mass slaughter an acceptable solution for eradicating foot and mouth disease. Therefore, that has a huge bearing on our emergency preparedness and response. Um, biodiversity, I won't speak any more about it. Um, Paul covered off on that. Um, and how we manage diseases that are transmitted between animals and humans. I'll pick up on that again in a, in a minute. Also, cross-sector issues. Um, there are, in terms of our emer emergency response needs, there are pests and diseases that, that affect um, you know, animals, wildlife, the environment, public health. A, an ongoing challenge for us is to know how to manage those cross-sector pests and diseases. And, and, and those that, um, uh, you know, it's hard to capture through our emergency response deeds. That's something that the council talks about a lot and we're <laughs> often scratching our heads saying, we know it's an issue, how do we move forwards? That's something that we'll have to tackle. Um, okay, so just some examples of these. Well, th uh, these are just some recent examples that also relate to our transition to management programs and also showing how quick they kind of hit the newspapers and also what a good job um, DEF is doing in, in finding them, that, that we are actually finding these, these um, pests and diseases. An interesting one, Asian tiger mosquito, I was talking to um, Chris Chillicott in Queensland, DEF, yesterday. This is in the Torres Strait. Um, this is Edie's albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. This mosquito is the best vector for arboviruses compared to any other mosquito. And um, so it carries dengue. Um, in experimental research, it's also shown it can tr transmit Japanese encephalitis. So, you know, for the pig industry, because pigs um, uh, amplify, whoops, amplify um, this virus, it, it's something to be on the pig industry radar. Also, um, Andrew Spencer from APL was saying that um, just mosquito bites on pork car pig carcasses is, a, is an issue because you've got to take the, the skin off the carcass with, from the mosquito bites. And this is, this is a mosquito we don't want to get in Australia. It's really aggressive and vicious. And I think it will have bear impacts on our livestock sector. And I don't think it's on, on the radar for um, agriculture. And I think this example also highlights that in terms of eradicating this disease, we're trying to, uh, this mosquito in the Torres Strait, it primarily comes under the responsibility of the health department because of um, dengue. But do there need to be conversations between the health department, agriculture department, environment about this issue? And those, I think it's a little bit ad hoc. Um, the health department often thinks it can just go off and do its own thing, but really it's, it, it's a broader conversation. Emerging infectious disease. Um, this is a 
topic close to my heart, having been involved in establishing the Australian Biosecurity CRC for Emerging Infectious Disease. Um, disease emergence is increasing. 73% um, of, of emerging human pathogens are transmitted from animals, primarily wildlife. Um, and this is leading to, and the consequences are significant in terms of potential for new pan, for pandemics and epidemics. And this is driving a lot of uh, de um, development agency investment in um, hotspot areas, um, such as in Southeast Asia. And so there are new approaches emerging, which have got some jargon names called One Health, Eco Health, at the bottom of One Health and Eco Health is really, again, what Paul was saying, community-driven approaches for understanding impacts and community-driven solutions for how we're going to deal with those impacts. Um, this is pretty challenging for technical experts like vets. You know, we go in, to, we get involved in these um, development projects, and I'd say it's probably in Australia and, and in, you know, Vietnam and Laos. And you know, when you're an epidemiologist, you look to an epidemiological solution or tactic, because that's what we know about. And it's out of our comfort zone to say, well, how do we even conceptualise this problem? You know, And I think there's significant reforms that are happening and need to happen around how um, these disease problems are understood and how the impacts are understood and what are the sustainable ways for moving forwards. And, and Paul's work goes to the, to the heart of that. It's also about being more multidisciplinary, more integrated, learning how to work together and across sectors. Two minutes. Okay, just, um, oh, I'm gonna skip. Science and innovation, topic close to my heart. Um, it's very, very important. Ken, uh, Ken Ash from the OECD pretty much said that in terms of building our, um, Australia's competitive um, advantage, it really, given all of the global market forces, it really comes down to innovation. And I think it's equally important for um, biosecurity. There's a national reform agenda happening where um, we've just, I've just been involved in um, co-authoring a national animal biosecurity rd &E strategy, which is out for consultation with the, with the stakeholders. Um, this is the bit, I want to be a bit controversial. We took a capability audit for this strategy and I've always, I'm a skeptic. I'm not sure that these bureaucratic exercises in counting, counting stuff is really where the leadership needs to be. Um, I think we could probably do it a lot better. We need to think of better methods for understanding our capability that are more timely, more responsive. Already the audit that we undertook is out of date because state government, there's been massive state government changes since the audit results came in. Um, you don't need an audit to know that we don't bat to the third man when it comes to pith fish pathologists in Australia. Um, you know, while we're doing the audit, are we kind of really looking hard at where the, um, I think, particular specialist skills expertise resides? What do we need? Um, just since the state government cuts, we've lost uh, some, a, a handful of really talented uh, people that, you know, it, it takes 20 years to train these people. Um, it's not just their expertise, it's their relationships. I actually feel the growth of them going, because I'm thinking, well, who am I going to call? You know, like, it's just when they're not there. There's, we don't have the succession plans, um, and, this, and I think this is a critical issue. It's fine in peacetime. I think we're a little bit comfortable at the moment because we haven't had a significant event, but when... I want to resort to jargon. <laughs> But when the, you know, when the shit hits the fan, we need those experts. And if, if they've all been retrenched or um, forced out of our, our, our government agencies for whatever reason, uh, we'll be calling them out of retirement. And I have, I've heard that that's already happening, that, that recent retirees are having to be called back when issues come up because the key expert happens to be away on leave. So that's my soapbox moment. Um, understanding the triple bottom line of impacts. This goes to what Paul was saying. In any review of R&D I've seen, internationally and, and in Australia, it always comes back to we need to get a better handle of the social, economic and environmental impacts. That's got to drive the agenda. If we don't have a good handle on that, we're kind of kidding ourselves. Um, two scenarios for these strategies. So what we've done with these, I know about the animal biosecurity rd &E strategy, we're now proposing new governance arrangements, which is very inclusive, involves all the government agencies, all the universities, all the livestock industries. It's a broad church. My concern is it'll become one long talk fest, cost a lot of money, take up a lot of people's time, actually reduce the capacity to do the work that they're already doing because of the time it takes to, 
be involved in these national collaborations with no um, significant you know, good decision making and actions coming out of it. So that's the challenge for these strategies. It'll be interesting to come back in five years' time and see what they have delivered. Um, I'm concerned that without the right people leading it, it could just mean a lot of activity for no, for limited gain. That's, that's the challenge. Um, we've got good people and I'm optimistic that we can do it right. Um, certainly, I think the industry groups bring really good discipline to the table. They're very good at saying, well, what's the point of that? And I think in terms of the academics, you know, of course, academics are driven by their personal research interests and they can be very good at pushing forward their agenda. I think the conversation between government, academia, industry is a very important conversation to have and it brings a very important discipline to the conversation. But we do need to focus on um, actually doing stuff, not just talking about it for the next three years, which we've been talking about it for the last three years. Very long time to, to move. Just put this slide up only because I love the ideas. Um, these are the choices that biosecurity professionals are always having to make these trade-offs between these different paradigms in terms of how we develop policy and innovation. And, and I think it just shows how much change and shift is happening and these, these, are the, these are the conscious choices we need to make in terms of developing policy and innovation. Conclusions. Um, build the partnerships, um, goes to what Paul was saying, it is about trust, it is about relationships. It's really um, disheartening when you people see people moving out of the biosecurity space because they're burnt out or for, for whatever, free from resource constraints. These are really valuable people. The relationships are important. We don't, we need to watch that there isn't too much churn. We, Agriculture has always been a pretty stable sector, but I think in recent years there has there's been more growing churn, and I think we want to hang on to that, that that loyal, highly skilled workforce, and and because those relationships are important, we do need joint decision making. Uh, it's as as Paul was saying, it's not about developing, um, you know, developing approaches and then taking it out. Uh, you've got to be very careful about when you take ideas to other groups, don't you? You can go early with some concepts or you can go late with everything fully formulated, at which point the other stakeholders are immediately on the back foot. And, and you might think you're saving time by developing it all up front, but in fact you can be going two steps back because then it takes another year to bring everyone else along with you. And you often have to go back to square one. That was certainly my experience in, in being involved in developing the animal biosecurity RD and &E strategy. We lost we lost 12 months by taking it way too far too quickly. Okay, and innovation, we can do it better. There's a lot of scope for co-investment in innovation that isn't being realised. It can be much more efficient. It can be much more co cooperative. I'm interested to see that the stakeholders actually are more interested in doing capability audits than looking at the data on what has been invested in R&D and how we could have done it better. I, and the data is there. I was involved in doing the survey and and that people kind of shy away from some of that data. I think it's well worth looking at. Um, leadership, um, taking action on the critical gaps. I think we've, we've got to keep an eye on that, particularly at the moment with state governments reducing their investment in agriculture, state ag agencies. And maintaining, we, we do a fabulous job, we are world class, and we just want to maintain that legacy of world class systems and capability. Thank you very much.